On August 24, 1814, the United States of America was humiliated more than any other time in history. More than 4,000 British soldiers marched into Washington, D.C. In a matter of hours, they burned the Capitol and most other public buildings. With the Capitol in ruins, the president in hiding, and most of the army in retreat, America faced a difficult choice. Surrender to despair or find a source of strength and hope. Congressman John Randolph of Roanoke, Virginia. Peace or war, the ruin of this country is inevitable. His good friend, Francis Scott Key, disagreed. As he later explained, We are responsible for the most sacred of trusts to our country, to the world, to our God. Three weeks later, the British surrounded the city of Baltimore in preparation for the destruction of one of America's most important commercial centers. Now a captive of the British, Francis Scott Key held on to hope as he wrote the words that were to become our national anthem. In the rocket's red glare, bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Three months later, the war ended and America gained a voice for the spirit of optimism that was to define the nation for centuries to come. And if Francis Scott Key were alive today, he would almost certainly ask, Does that star-spangled banner yet wave? Or the land of the free and the home the brave. And the home of the brave. This is Terra Rubra. It's what's left of a large plantation on Pipe Creek in Maryland, just nine miles south of the Mason-Dixon line. Key loved the estate where he was born, but he was never a farmer. Yet to the end of his days, he would return here for solace and escape from city life. Fifty years later, he wrote of a journey home. The country is enchanting. In every field, the grain is cut down and piled up in stacks that are so thick, the valley seems to laugh and sing. Such are the fields of gold. Then the corn and the grapes cover all the others in various shades of green. I do not think I have seen such wheat since I was a boy. Open spaces were plentiful at Terra Rubra, but opportunities for a promising young man were not, and so Francis Scott Key completed his education while staying with his grandmother in the state capital of Annapolis. Years earlier, she had lost her sight while rescuing two servants from a burning building, and it fell to her young grandson to read the Bible to her. As the young man gained confidence, his grandmother would invite her friends to hear him read. Key developed the strong voice that would last throughout his life. The Key family was large and well-connected, and it was just a matter of time until Francis came into contact with the very prominent Lloyd family, including their daughter, Mary. But there were other rivals. Some were wealthier, some stronger, and many more distinguished. Instead of promising riches or a life of glamour, young Frank Key sent poetry. Be mine through toil and pain to win the beam of Mary's gladdened eyes. Perhaps she'll value more, my love. Perhaps, Perhaps give, give more, more of hers, hers to, to me. me. Perhaps may greet me with a smile more sweet. If smile more sweet can be. And Mary used the paper to curl her hair. 
If there is a single characteristic that is apparent throughout the life of Francis Scott Key, it is optimism. While Mary showed little interest in the young man from Terra Rubra, he continued to send love poems. But then, if the young woman hadn't secretly saved them, we wouldn't know about them today. Key completed his education and became qualified as a lawyer. He went into partnership with his brother-in-law, Roger Taney, in this small office in Frederick, Maryland. The details of the courtship are lost to history, but after three years, Key's perseverance paid off. Francis and Mary Key were married and moved to Georgetown, a separate community within the newly established District of Columbia. They were together for 41 years, had 11 children, and Francis Scott Key never stopped writing poems for Mary. Francis Scott Key joined the law practice of his uncle, Philip Barton Key, an extremely successful jurist who built his large home in what was then a rural part of the District of Columbia. They worked on a number of cases together, but one of the biggest came when Francis was just 25 years old. It was 1804, and the balance of power between branches of the government was not yet fully settled. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase argued for the right of the judiciary to review and overturn laws and acts it deemed unconstitutional. President Jefferson disagreed and arranged for the impeachment of Chase. Because Justice Chase was a family friend, it wasn't surprising that Philip Barton Key was his attorney and that young Francis assisted. The trial was conducted in the House of Representatives and presided over by the vice president. The prosecution was led by the president's second cousin, Congressman John Randolph of Roanoke, Virginia. Randolph was a fiery and impassioned speaker, a champion of states' rights, and a fiercely independent thinker. Ultimately, Chase was acquitted and the constitutional questions settled. But through the process, Francis Scott Key and John Randolph became lifelong friends. In a series of letters, they discussed philosophy, politics, and a passion they both shared for the new field of romantic poetry. My dear friend, I have long ago resolved that there shall be no such poet as Walter Scott as long as he lives, and I can admire nobody that pretends to rival him. Dear Frank, I cannot yield the precedence of Lord Byron to Walter Scott. No poet in our times, Shakespeare or Milton apart, has the same power over my feelings as Byron. St. John's Episcopal in Georgetown was the church home of the Key family, and the walls still bear inscriptions in verse written by the young lawyer. As lay reader, he now read the Bible aloud each Sunday, just as he had for his grandmother and her friends years before. Francis Scott was open about his faith and often spoke about it. I don't believe there are any new objections to be discovered to the truths of Christianity though there may be an art to presenting old ones in a new dress. In a time when many prominent people described themselves as deists, Key was occasionally ridiculed or even called fanatic. Frank Key? A fanatic? <laughs> Why, I heard him called so not ten days ago. Key was not a fanatic, but he remained ever the optimist, while Randolph, pained by poor health, rejected by women, and often unpopular for his politics, was often on the verge of despair. I hope that there is not another creature in the world as unhappy as myself. This I can say to you. To the world I endeavor to put on a different countenance and hold a bolder language, but it is sheer hypocrisy, assumed to guard against the pity of mankind. My dear friend, pain and sickness are sad companions anywhere. He alone who sends them can give us strength and faith to bear them as we ought. 
I wish you every relief. But above all this, let me hear from you as often as you can. Both men were lawyers, but while Randolph became a prominent congressman, Key chose to remain in private practice. I was half inclined to turn politician. I, I did feel something like it. But the fit is over. I shall, I hope, stay quietly at home and mind my business, as long as it lasts. But the business did not last. And soon, politics became unavoidable. By 1812, Europe was entangled in the most devastating war it had ever experienced as Russia, Spain, and Britain struggled against the forces of Napoleon. The British Navy had a terrible shortage of sailors, and it found a ready supply on American merchant ships. The nation was divided. Randolph and Key believed a diplomatic solution could be found, while others, including President James Madison, felt war was the only way to assert American dignity. They were asserting their right not to have their ships boarded by the British on international waters and sailors dragged off American ships. Had they buckled under and just let the British do that, then they were surrendering their sovereignty. So they, Congress declared war on Britain. Many people said it was foolhardy. The British had a thousand ships, America had 20. The war resulted in a blockade, which crippled the trade-based economy of the Northeast. Citizens in Massachusetts and Connecticut were so outraged that many called for separation from the Union. And while Key opposed the war, he had no sympathies for those who would break up the country for financial gain. I cannot help suspecting them of selfish views. And that if they can collect strength enough, they will separate. Between the North and the South lies the city of Baltimore, where the population was overwhelmingly pro-war. When hostilities were declared, the people burst into public celebrations. There was British anger toward the people of Baltimore, but most of their resources were tied up with more pressing concerns in Europe. By the summer of 1814, most of the war in Europe appeared to be over. Napoleon was captured, and the British turned their military might on their former colonies. An invasion of the U.S. East Coast was expected. The Secretary of War calculated that the British attack would be at Baltimore, where pro-war sentiment had run so high. Forty miles away, residents of Washington, D.C. thought otherwise. Paul Jennings was a teenage African-American slave of President Madison and his wife, Dolly. And he was a very perceptive man. After the war had been going on for a couple of years, the people of Washington began to become alarmed for the safety of the city, as the British held the Chesapeake Bay with a powerful fleet and army. Francis Scott Key long opposed to the war, felt differently when his own home was threatened, and enlisted as a lieutenant. The British ground forces were under the command of an Irishman, General Robert Ross, a strict disciplinarian and champion of the Napoleonic Wars. Upon seeing the weak defenses, General Ross and the naval commanders decided Baltimore could wait. They set their sights on the nation's capital. Francis Scott Key realized how serious the threat was to his home, his family, and his country. In a letter he wrote to his parents, two days before the British arrived in Washington, he told them to rededicate themselves to God, who would not forsake those who trusted in him. Those were his words. Although the commanders continued to maintain that Washington would not be attacked, the people took flight. The American forces, including Francis Scott Key, prepared to meet the British at Bladensburg, Maryland, just outside the capital district. The defenders had a significantly larger force than the invaders, but they were no match for the professionals of the British Army. Francis Scott Key's brother-in-law 
and former law partner Roger Taney was with the family at the time. And Mrs. Key refused to leave the home while Mr. Key was thus daily exposed to danger. We became very anxious about the family's situation. For if the attack were made, Mr. Key would be with the troops engaged in the defense. Well, on the 24th of August, sure enough, the British reached Bladensburg, and the fight began between 11 and 12. Even that very morning, General Armstrong assured Mrs. Madison that there was no danger. The president rode out on horseback to Bladensburg to see how things looked. From a nearby hill, the president and most of the cabinet watched the battle unfold. American forces were under the command of William Winder, a reservist with less than two years military experience. As he attempted to organize the mass of amateur soldiers, he received countless suggestions from his superiors and even some of his subordinates. Mr. Francis Key of Georgetown informed me that the troops coming out of the city could most advantageously be posted to the left and to the right of the road near that point. Mr. Key undertook to show the positions proposed. The British also had another advantage. This is a Congreve rocket, an unguided explosive missile recently introduced into the British Army. The Americans had never seen anything like it. These were very unreliable uh, rockets. Uh, nobody knew where they would land, but they were terrifying. They came with a hissing sound, and they could be fired from land or on the ships. And they terrified the Americans, particularly at the Battle of Bladensburg, preceding the capture of Washington, because the um, British lowered uh, the rocket um, launchers, and so they would not arc high, but they would actually come very close to um, the level of uh, the heads of the Americans. And this hissing sound uh, really scared them. The American lines collapsed, and many of the untrained soldiers ran away in panic. Here was events to one of the great defects of all undisciplined and unorganized troops. No efforts could rouse the officers and men to the exertion necessary. Such of them that could be halted, instead of making these efforts, gave themselves up to the uncontrolled feelings which fatigue, exhaustion, and privation produced. Although the British prevailed at Bladensburg, they took heavy losses from the battle and from the sweltering summer heat. It was extremely hot. That same day, 18 British soldiers had died of heat exhaustion, heat exhaustion uh, at the Battle of Bladensburg. There were not enough doctors available and the British wounded were loaded onto wagons and taken to physicians in the local area, including the respected William Beans, living 15 miles away at Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Dr. Beans, as perhaps you know, was the leading physician in Upper Marlboro, an accomplished scholar and a gentleman. He was well respected by all who knew him and the intimate friend of Mr. Key. Anna Hanson Dorsey knew the doctor well. Her mother was a guest at his house during and after the battle. To love his country and hate the English was the doctor's creed, and he let slip no opportunity to toast the one and drink confusion to the other. While the wounded were treated out of compassion, the victors marched into Washington unopposed. There was horror. Uh, one of Paul Jennings' uh, acquaintances hid in a baking oven. People did irrational things, and they did them because they were so fearful. A free colored man who had accompanied Mr. Madison to Bladensburg galloped up to the house, waving his hat, cried out, clear out, clear out. General Armstrong has ordered a retreat. All then was confusion. Dolly Madison, the president's wife, refused to be rushed. She'd agreed to meet her husband, the president, James Madison, in Virginia, after she'd done a few things in the White House. And she insisted on staying to put until a painting of George Washington, painted by Gilbert Stuart, was saved 
from the advancing British. She wanted to save this for future generations at the risk of her life. John Sousa and McGraw, the president's gardener, took it down and sent it off on a wagon with some large silver urns and other such valuables as could be hastily got a hold of. The British scrupulously respected civilians and their property as they destroyed the city. One of the first buildings they demolished was the Capitol building. This was always uh, meant to be a symbol, a symbol of the nascent republic, um, a democratic republic where voice would be given to the common man. And so it remained a gleaming beacon, uh, which it is today, even. So that's why when it was destroyed, there was profound grief amongst Americans, because this was a symbol of the unity. British soldiers continued to set fire to government buildings as they marched down Pennsylvania Avenue to the president's house. So unexpected was our entry and capture of Washington, and so confident was Madison of the defeat of our troops that he had prepared a supper for the expected conquerors. When the British did arrive, they ate up the very dinner and drank the wines, etc., that I had prepared for the president's party. And success to his majesty's arms by sea and land was drunk in the best wines. Madison, having taken to his heels and ensured his safety on the opposite bank of the river by having the bridge broken down. That night, the British burned the White House. Every single thing was destroyed, everything. All that were left were wobbly walls enclosing ash and charred wood. Few people would have believed as flames filled the sky on the night of August 24, 1814, that this would one day become the most powerful nation in the history of the world. In the present unhappy state of the public mind, I doubt whether the union of these states would survive the shock produced by the loss of the capital. Francis Scott Key held on to hope, as he later remarked. Our scheme of government was looked upon by the world as an experiment. Most unworthy of our inheritance shall we be if we suffer it to perish in our hands. The British had made their point, and the next day they set out for Baltimore, Capturing Washington had been symbolic. Baltimore, an important shipping center and America's third largest city, was business. Within a few days, the British passed through Upper Marlboro, not far from the home of Key's friend, Dr. William Beans. Stragglers who had left the ranks to plunder or for some other motive made their appearance from time to time, singly or in small groups and Dr. Beans put himself at the head of a small body of citizens. They conceived the brilliant idea of making prisoners of the enemy, which, with the assistance of their servants, they succeeded in doing, and they conveyed them to the courthouse for safekeeping, locked them in, placed a guard over them, and returned home to sleep on their laurels. Beans may have believed that he was defending his property, but the British interpreted his actions as an attack. A detachment was sent back to Dr. Bean's house around midnight, compelled him to rise from his bed and hurried him off to the British camp. Dr. Beans, who was taken from his bed, barely allowed time to clothe himself, forced at the point of a bayonet to mount a horse and made to accompany the party. 
I am informed that a party from your army a few nights ago took Dr. Beans, a respectable aged man, out of his bed, treated him with great rudeness, and indignantly took him to your camp, and that he is now on shipboard. What has occasioned this procedure so unusual in warfare among civilized nations? The whole countryside was roused and indignant. An application was made to the President of the United States to authorize some plan for his release. The President's house was a ruin, and from his temporary residence at the Octagon House, President Madison appointed John Skinner, the official U.S. prisoner exchange officer, to immediately arrange for the doctor's release. The undersigned was instructed to take along Mr. Key of Washington his mission having exclusive reference to the release of Dr. Beans. His friends were persuaded that something might be hoped from Mr. Key's tact and persuasive manners in getting the doctor released. Accompanied by Skinner, Key approached the British fleet under a flag of truce. He was conducted to the narrow, comfortless place where Dr. Beans was imprisoned. The meeting was full of emotion on both sides, as may be imagined. Mr. Key had an interview with Dr. Beads. He found him in the forward part of the ship with the sailors and soldiers. He had not had a change of clothes from the time that he was seized, was constantly treated with indignity, and no officer would speak to him. He was treated as a culprit and not as a prisoner of war. Dr. Beans remained in irons as the British fleet made its way up the Chesapeake Bay toward Baltimore. In the officers' quarters of the same ship, Key and Skinner struggled to negotiate his release, but the commanders refused to relent. Never was a man more disappointed in his expectations than I have been as to the character of British officers. With some exceptions, they have been illiberal, ignorant, and vulgar, and seem filled with a spirit of malignity against everything American. Perhaps, however, I saw them in unfavorable circumstances. The British planned a two-pronged attack on the city of Baltimore. Ground troops, under the command of General Ross, would flank the city from the north, while the Navy attacked from the east. The long-range naval guns would easily be able to bombard the city and its defenses once they got past the star-shaped Fort McHenry. A line of barricades was built around the city. Across one side of the harbor, a string of old vessels was sunk to prevent ships from approaching. The tables are turned because people were so angry about what had happened in Washington that 15,000 Americans uh, dovetailed on Baltimore to defend it. Armaments and supplies were stockpiled throughout the fort, including the powder magazine. And during the Battle of Baltimore, upwards of 200,000 pounds of gunpowder were being stored in here for the defense of Fort McHenry, as well as the city of uh, Baltimore. Finally, as the fleet came into the view of the city, there was a breakthrough in the negotiations on board the command ship. It, however, happened, fortunately, that Mr. Skinner carried with him letters from the wounded British officers left at Bladensburg. And in those letters to their friends on board the fleet, they all spoke of the humanity and kindness with which they had been treated once they had fallen into our hands. Dr. Beans deserves more punishment than he has received. But I feel myself bound to make a return for the kindness which he has shown to my wounded officers and upon that ground and that only. I will release him. But the party was not allowed to return home. Because the British now told him, you yourself will be a hostage until we have captured Baltimore. Because you and Dr. Beans know the strength of our forces, you know the target is Baltimore, you know the strength of our fleet, you know our morale. How can we possibly release you now? You will spread all this information to the American military. Seeing no help for it, I demanded we should be returned to our own vessel during the attack. It was from her deck 
in view of Fort McHenry that we witnessed through an anxious attack day and night. Mr. Key and Mr. Skinner were then sent on board the deck of their own vessel with a guard of sailors or marines to prevent them from landing. They were permitted to take Dr. Beans, and they considered themselves fortunate to be anchored in a position which enabled them to distinctly see the flag of Fort McHenry from the deck of the vessel. On Monday morning, very early, it was perceived that the enemy was landing troops on the east side of the Patapsco, distant about 10 miles. General Ross landed with 5,000 soldiers. Ross received reports of the defenses of the city, but he remembered the disorganization of the American militia he met at Bladensburg. Militia. I don't care a straw if it rains militia. But before attacking, he stopped at a local farmhouse and ordered the homeowner to provide breakfast for command officers. The farmer complied, and as soldiers began to leave, he asked if he would be expected to prepare supper as well. I shall sup in Baltimore tonight, or in hell. General Ross did not sup that night in Baltimore. He was killed by a sniper within the hour. Without their charismatic leader, the land forces fought their way to the outskirts of the city and waited for the naval attack. Right behind us is Baltimore Harbor. Uh, this is the Patapsco River. It falls into the Chesapeake Bay, which we see on the horizon. They're eight miles away. And to give you a perspective of where the British bombardment fleet w was, they were anchored half the distance to the bridge. The bridge is four miles away. So that puts the British fleet about two miles, just out of range of Fort McHenry's guns here. On Tuesday morning, about sunrise, the enemy commenced the attack from his five bomb vessels. When finding that his shells reached us, he anchored and kept up a well-directed and incessant bombardment. We immediately opened our batteries and kept a brisk fire from our guns and mortars. But unfortunately, our shot and shells all fell considerably short of him. This was, to me, a most distressing circumstance. On the far side of the harbor, Key and the others could only watch and wait as the bombardment continued throughout the day. As the sun began to set, there was no respite from the torrent of explosives that rained down on the fortress. The last golden beams of day lingered over shore and wave like a parting benediction, while from the ramparts of Fort McHenry proudly waved the American flag, which God of nations had protected up to that time from dishonor, and which it is our firm hope that he will continue to protect until the last sun that shall ever rise on the earth lights up its stars and stripes with its parting glory. Congreve rockets mounted on ships hammered away through the night. He and Mr. Skinner remained on deck during the night, watching every shell from the moment it was fired until it fell, listening with breathless interest to hear if an explosion followed. During the bombardment, which lasted about 25 hours, from the best calculation I can make, from 15 to 1,800 shells were thrown by the enemy. They could actually feel the ground trembling during the battle because of the bursting of the shells and the massive artillery batteries being fired. Great big balls like that of metal. And when the lit fuse touched the gunpowder inside, then it would explode, spraying metal all over. So the ideal place for these to explode would be about waist high of a human being so that it could scatter this shrapnel all over the place and kill a lot of people. Some of them exploded prematurely, bombs bursting in air. In the rocket's red glare, bombs bursting in air. The bombs bursting in air was but a verified and almost literal transcript of our expressed hopes and apprehensions through that ever memorable period of anxiety to all, but never despair. 
From his vantage point, Key could have only guessed the fate of the fort and its defenders. Though I walked upon a deck surrounded by a hostile fleet, detained as a prisoner, yet was my step firm and my heart strong. One of the bombs made a precise hit on the fort's powder magazine. A British mortar shell, 200 pounds of exploding cast iron metal, uh, penetrated these walls and landed within the midst of all this gunpowder. Fortunately, because of the heavy thunderstorms that were occurring at the time, uh, the fuse uh, simply went out. Had it gone off, this would probably be a national seashore and the Battle of Baltimore might have been different. While the bombardment continued, it was sufficient proof that the fort had not surrendered. Throughout the night, he paced the deck of his ship in the darkness, hoping the explosions would continue, because if there was silence, it might mean the fort had capitulated. But in the darkness before dawn, there was a lull in the firing. And as they had no communication with any of the enemy's ships, they did not know whether the fort had surrendered or the attack upon it had been abandoned. The ships around Francis Scott Key were silent. No firing came from the distant fort. There were only two possible explanations. Either the fort had fallen, its defenders killed or captured, or despite 25 hours of incessant bombardment, the Americans had somehow prevailed. Key watched and waited, still clinging to hope. But gradually the morning mist began to clear. Oh say, can you see by the dawn's early light? And... I saw the flag of my country waving over a city. The noise of the conflict fell upon my listening ear and told me that the brave and the free had met the invaders. Dr. Beans, with his usual impetuosity, sent an exultant huzzah out to the port to greet it, while Mr. Key, with a heart full and glowing, penciled on the back of an old letter one or two stanzas. In that hour of deliverance and a joyful triumph, the heart spoke. And does not such a country and such defenders of their country deserve a song? With it came an inspiration not to be resisted. If it had been a hanging matter to make a song, I must have made it. It took four verses of eight lines each to express Key's feelings. Now it catches the gleam of the morning's first beam, in full glory reflected, now shines in the stream. Tis the star-spangled banner, a long may it wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. In the words to the national anthem, you can feel it's palpable, his ecstasy, sheer ecstasy. That's the only word you could apply to what he witnessed because it was still there. That was proof that the fort had not fallen. So the flag had a new sheen to its glory and never before had he looked with such reverence upon the symbol of his country. The British withdrew and before long, Key and the others were released. The city of Baltimore erupted into joyous celebrations, but Francis Scott Key withdrew to a hotel where he continued to sketch and polish the lines of his poem. And where is that foe who so vauntingly swore that a home and a country would leave us no more? He said that on the next morning he took it to Judge Nicholson to see what he thought of it. That he was so much pleased with it that he immediately took it to a printer and directed that it be struck off in handbill form. And that he, Mr. Key, believed it to have been favorably received by the Baltimore public.
Within days, it was being sung to the tune of the Anacreontic Song, a slightly risque English melody that celebrates the joys of love, drinking, and poetry. And within three days after that song was published, it hit the top of the charts, and people began to look at the flag in a whole different light. Over the next few weeks, the work appeared in newspapers throughout the country. It gave us something we had never had before, a flag, and the symbolism of the flag. For the first time, someone, Francis Scott Key, put down on paper four verses about that banner that flew over Fort McHenry. And for the first time, Americans began to look at the flag in a whole different light. It really is a turning point in American history at Fort McHenry because it was, the, uh, it was a resurgence of nationalism that came out of this war, a unifying um, activity at the end of the war. People once again became Americans. As soon as he was able to leave, Key was reunited with his family. Almost immediately, Key wrote about his experience to his friend, John Randolph. I hope I shall never cease to feel the warmest gratitude when I think of this most merciful deliverance. It seems to have given me a, a higher idea of the forbearance, long-suffering, and tender mercy of God than I had ever before conceived. About three months later, the war ended. When the news of peace arrived, we were crazed with joy. I played the President's March on the violin. John Souza and some others were drunk for two days. Oh, <laughs> and such a joyful time was never seen in Washington. Mr. Madison and all of his cabinet were as pleased as any. <laughs> but they did not show their joy in this manner. The Star-Spangled Banner expressed the national hope and pride of America in 1814. Unfortunately, there was also a matter of national shame in 1814, and slavery is actually mentioned within the words of the national anthem. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. Francis Scott Key was born on a plantation in the American South. The man who dubbed this the land of the free owned slaves for much of his life. Over time, he freed most of them, but he retained a few who were too old to find work or to otherwise support themselves. I've emancipated seven of my slaves. They're doing pretty well now, and six of them now alive are supporting themselves comfortably and creditably. Yet I cannot but see that that is all they are doing. And when age and infirmity come upon them, they will probably suffer. I knew Mr. Key very well when he recited at Georgetown, and he used to visit Montgomery Courthouse to practice law at the bar, where he often volunteered to defend the downtrodden sons and daughters of Africa. Mr. Key convinced me that slavery was wrong, radically wrong. Where else, except in slavery, was ever such a bed of torture prepared by man for man? Key favored ending slavery through legal means, but at the same time there were many abolitionists who advocated ending slavery by any means necessary. Often that meant violence, and when he was appointed district attorney for the District of Columbia, it became his duty to prosecute violence. If we believe in the existence of a great moral and political evil amongst us, and that duty, honor, and interest call upon us to prepare for their removal, we must act. Can we not claim at least this merit for our labors, that they are safe? Ultimately, American slavery ended with a level of violence far greater than anyone imagined. Francis Scott Key became one of the most prominent lawyers in the Washington area. When a madman unsuccessfully fired upon Andrew Jackson, 
Key prosecuted the first attempted presidential assassination, and when the fiery-tempered Sam Houston publicly beat a congressman with a stick, it was Key he chose as his defense attorney. But there are some cases even the best lawyers can't win. Francis Scott Key was one of the best men that ever lived. There were two things in the world he held dearer than all else in the world, his country and his God. He inculcated into his children and grandchildren this love. The question of states' rights versus federal power is not a new one, and in 1833 the new state of Alabama very nearly became the trigger in a civil war. A federal treaty promised some lands would be returned to the Creek Indians, but Governor John Gale argued the federal government had no such power. Federal marshals arrived to forcibly remove the white settlers, and the state government issued orders for the arrest of the federal officers. Northern politicians believed that Alabama must be brought in line. And while many pushed for a military solution, President Andrew Jackson chose to send a negotiator. He needed someone who was loyal, but neither soldier nor politician someone well-known and respected, who had a gift for tact. Not surprisingly, the man he chose was Francis Scott Key. Mr. Francis Scott Key, the district attorney for the District of Columbia, is here at present. He is very pleasant, intelligent, you at once perceive, and somewhat peculiar in his manners. Key was greeted with honors in the state capital of Tuscaloosa, but when the local band played the Star-Spangled Banner for him, he did not recognize the melody. Historians are divided between whether Key was actually tone-deaf, if he thought of his work only as a poem and not as a song, or if the band just wasn't very good. As soon as he lifts his eyes, usually fixed upon some object near the floor, the man of sense, of fancy, and the poet is seen, but the crowning trait of his character I have just discovered he is a Christian. Governor Gale had been firm that he would not back down to the president. But the president's emissary worked quietly behind the scenes, in the community, and with the governor's own family. He sat an hour or two last night talking to me and the children. He made Sarah read for him, and then he read for her some of the fine hymns and psalms, one of his own, beginning... Lord, with glowing heart, I'd praise thee. While once a young woman used Key's verse as a beauty aid, the Society Girls of Alabama clamored for a snippet or souvenir. On the night of December 10th, a young girl and Mrs. Gale conspired to leave the girl's journal in Key's room with a request for a poem. Key complied. Yet over all this land so fair still waves the flag of stripe and star. Yes, I have looked around me here and felt I was no foreigner. And to a poet, sounds how dear, my own song sweetly chanted here. The joy with which these scenes I view tells me this is my country too. The poem warmly describes the natural beauty of Alabama as part of the unique experience that is America. It was quickly published in newspapers throughout the country. The people of Alabama were delighted and a compromise was reached. For the time being, civil war had been averted not through politics or power, but at least partly through poetry. Although it wasn't officially adopted for a century, the Star Spangled Banner was at times referred to as the national anthem during Key's lifetime. Yet, despite being the author of one of the most popular songs in American history, there is no evidence that he ever earned a cent from any of his verse. During his lifetime, Key would never consent to have any of his poems published. Key took his triumphs in other ways, including the relationship with his friend, John Randolph. Randolph was an intellectual, and though his heart was troubled, his brain wrestled with issues of faith, hope, and despair. 
Is there not selfishness at the bottom of that yearning of my heart to believe? Can that faith, setting aside its imperfection, be acceptable in the sight of God, to which the unhappy sinner is first moved by the sense of self-preservation? Do not be disheartened by the difficulties you may feel. They are experienced by all, and grace and strength to overcome them are offered to all. If you are convinced that you are a sinner, that Christ alone can save you from the sentence of condemnation incurred by your sins, if you thus humbly and faithfully come to him, he will in no wise cast you out. May you experience this change, my dear friend, in all its blessedness. On September 17, 1818, Francis Scott Key received a letter he had anxiously awaited for more than 14 years. Congratulate me, dear Frank. Wish me joy you need not. Give it you cannot. I am at last reconciled to my God and have assurance of his pardon through faith in Christ, against which the very gates of hell cannot prevail. Fear hath been driven out by perfect love. For the first time I understand your feelings and character and that of every real Christian. I do indeed, my dear friend, rejoice with you. I have long wished and often believed with confidence that you would experience what God has now blessed you with. May the grace that has brought you from darkness to light, from death to life, keep you forever. In January 1843, Key made a brief argument before the Supreme Court, then presided over by his brother-in-law, Roger Taney. He then went out to visit his daughter and grandchildren in Baltimore. The journey, which had taken several days aboard a British ship 30 years before, now took only a few hours. Three days later, Francis Scott Key died of a lung ailment. He was 63. He had written many times about death and saw it through the same sense of hope that stayed with him all of his days. The poet's heart, though time his verse may save, must chill with age and perish in the grave. The patriot, too, must close his watchful eye upon the land he loves. His latest sigh, all he has left to give it ere he die. But when the Christian faith in power hath spoke to the bowed heart, and the world's spell is broke, that heart transformed, a never-dying flame warms with new energy above the claim. Modern literary scholars seldom include Francis Scott Key among the greats of poetry. His rhythms are often simple and his rhymes obvious. But if the measure of a poem is its ability to move, to inspire, and to honor, then greatness is where you find it. O oh, thus be it ever, when free men shall stand between their loved home and the war's desolation, Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must, when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. and drive.